Hello listeners and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your co-host, Jennifer Mernan. On this episode, we interview Lier Keith, author, activist, and radical feminist. Please visit YouTube where you will find her brilliant PowerPoint presentation on nonviolent direct action. It is an essential complement to this episode in which we dive deeply into a very intense and personal account of nonviolent direct action in practice at a recent action in Portland, Oregon. Lear, welcome back to the Green Flame. It's great to have you here again. I really would like to hear this time uh, about your involvement with the Women's Declaration International USA, uh, specifically the tour that happened in 2023. Um, Could you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So uh, Women's Declaration International is a big group and the headquarters essentially is in England, but there's chapters all over the world. So it's a great group to investigate if you're a radical feminist or a feminist of any kind, take a look. It's called that because they wrote a declaration about all the rights that women should have. And you're welcome to sign on to that document. It's a really important document and they're trying to get it accepted into the UN and other places around the world. So it's important in these times to reassert and to reclaim all the rights that have been taken from women over the last decade. So what's been happening is um, there is an entire movement of men who want to claim to be women and they have claimed our rights. So they claim that they are allowed into our sports and our prisons and our bathrooms and our changing rooms and our domestic violence shelters and our rape crisis shelters and our breast cancer support groups and um, anything to do with teenage girls, they're allowed in because they somehow have a special woman identity And that should override the fact that they actually are male. There's a whole history, you know, where this movement came from and and why they've gotten so powerful, but they are winning around the globe. They are changing laws, everything from the census, taking the census to in Australia, it's been declared illegal for lesbian groups to be women only. If it's more than 12 women, they have to accept men into the group. I don't know why this isn't an outrage around the world. You might as well be living in Iran. That's how bad it is. So stuff like that. And they are putting men in women's prisons. And every single study that has ever been done shows that these men who call themselves women who are in prison, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of them are in for sexual offenses. So these are high level sex offenders for the most part. The statistic for other men is 13 percent. The statistic for men who are pretending to be women is usually between 40 and 50 percent. So there was just one that came out this week is that 44% of them are sex offenders and and not just any sex offenders, like the, really the high level ones, the ones that are in for, you know, rape and murder, for being serial sex killers um, from absolutely deranged levels of sexual violence against women and children. So that's who we're dealing with. And I don't know why we're not allowed to say it out loud, uh, but we're not because what happens when we try to point this out is that we get assaulted in public. So for me, this started in like 2011, they started coming after me that long ago, um, because I was a very outspoken radical feminist and they weren't going to have it. So what happens when women say no to men, any kind of men, for any reason, is you will be met with violence. So I've been dealing with this for a while. Other women, they're newer to the movement. A lot of women join because their children are affected. So all of these laws have changed so that very, very young children, and I'm not even close to being adults, can decide that they have been, quote, born in the wrong body. Um, This is what they're being told in school is that it's possible to be born in the wrong body. And then by the time they're 9, 10, 11, they're being medicalized, which is to say their bodies are being permanently altered. And I'm going to use the word destroyed because you should grow up and have a healthy reproductive set of organs and you should have healthy sexual organs. And this is what's destroyed when they're put on these drugs. These are children who, as adults, will never be able to choose to have children And a lot of them will simply never have any sexual function at all. So they're being put on a pathway at age 10 or 11. I just want people to understand the horror of this, that that these are people who will reach adulthood and never have sex. They will not have a sex drive and they will not have organs that function to let them have the pleasure that is our birthright as humans, that we are 
wired with the most incredible number of nerves in certain parts of our bodies. And this is being destroyed for these kids before they even have their first kiss. They have no idea what sex is and it's being taken away from them. So a lot of people get involved when they're, especially their teenage girls get taken into this. Um, and, and around the country, there's states like where I live in California, they don't, the parents don't have to be told that the kids are doing this. The kids can get medication without telling their parents. And they have what's called the child snatcher law. So if you object to this as a parent, your child will be taken from you and placed in state custody. And we have some horrendous stories about what has happened to these children once they are taken into state custody. So I'm not going to get into that today, but this is very serious around the world, what is happening to women and girls. And a lot of these kids would simply grow up to be gay and lesbian. We know that somewhere between 80 and 90% of them would simply be same-sex attracted and they would grow out of their discomfort with their bodies and go on to be <laughs> gay and lesbian adults who could have happy lives. And instead they're going to be medical patients for their the rest of their time on earth and it's completely horrendous this is just eugenics being done to gays and lesbians and a lot of these kids are also autistic so we're sterilizing the unfit once again this might as well be you know 1938 and yeah that's where we are so some of us have been fighting this and one group is wdi so they have this beautiful declaration about women's human rights and there's a group in the united states so there's branches all over the world and a lot of us have been you know, we've been going to these different events or we've been organizing these events where we're trying to do public education about this movement, this quote, transgender movement. What is gender ideology? Where did it come from? What are the impacts of it? Who's being affected? How is it hurting women and children? All of this. And every time we are met by a screaming mob and I have faced down this mob any number of times, you know, there's, again, there's a lot of women who are new to this and I don't think that they, a lot of them don't quite understand how bad it is till they try to come to one of these events and then they see the screaming mob. So my goal in all of this was to get women to understand that we think that we still have a first amendment in this country because it's still part of the constitution. And so we think that when we go out in public and do something like, you know, education, um, advocacy, or even a protest, you know, we're allowed to stand there with our signs saying, you know, woman equals adult human female or, leave gay kids alone or whatever the slogan is for the protest, that we have a right to do that because this is America and we have a first amendment. And in democracies, you're supposed to have this thing about free speech. You have a right to assemble. You have a right to make your opinions known. And we won that a long time ago in the West, in hundreds of years. I mean, some of this goes back to Magna Carta, that we have rights against the government. There are rights. They're not given to us by a king or by a group of powerful people, they're ours. We're born with them. We, you have them because you're human and they, they're not allowed to take them away from us. So this is a battle that's like long supposed to have been won. And now we're right back where we started because if women go out in public and say some of this, we're actually doing a direct confrontation with power. We're not just on the street using a right that is ours. We have to fight for it. And I want women to understand how bad the situation is. And I also, I very strongly believe that our best response to this is nonviolent direct action, then we're not going to get anywhere as long as we're behaving the way that they are. And I've been to any number of these kinds of demonstrations where the whole thing melts down and everybody's just screaming at everybody and violent things do happen. And it's very unclear who the perpetrators are because it's from both sides. And we need to hold to nonviolent discipline. The way the technique works is it makes the violence visible. The violence is there. It's in the structure of patriarchy. It's in male domination, but most of us on a daily level aren't gonna see it. When you challenge a system that is based on hierarchy, that has violence as the backdrop to keep hierarchy in place, when you challenge it, then the violence comes out and then the world has to see it. And so around the world, people have been using nonviolent direct action. I mean, honestly, for millennia, but over the last, I'd say a hundred years, this technique has really picked up steam because people have uh, really figured out sort of you know, what the dynamics of it are. And there have been some wonderful theorists who have written about it and studied it. And I would encourage everyone to read Gene Sharp is sort of the main theorist of this. But I mean, it goes back, you know, further than that. And, and you can see like the Irish struggle for independence, the suffrage movement, um, the, the anti-slavery movement, it, all of them tried really uh, brand new techniques of nonviolent direct action. They didn't call it that at the time, but that's what they were doing. And you can learn a lot just from reading the history there. And then it 
people keep understanding it deeper and deeper. And then you get to things like the civil rights movement in America, and, you know, and then in the, in the, the late fifties and into the sixties, they start really understanding that the dynamics of this and, and how to make it work. And then the anti-war movement and then into the seventies. So there's lots and lots of examples just from my lifetime of people using this. Um, and I just really want to reach people who are on my side of this, this fight and, and try to explain to them what we're doing and why. So all of this brings us to the tour. The WDI USA, the branch that's in the United States, decided that they they agreed with me and that that this was something that they also very strongly believed in, that this was a technique that they wanted um, our people to understand. So our troops, um, we wanted to get them educated to this. So we, we've been going around the country and doing these trainings. And then part of the training is we plan an action together. And then anyone who wants to is welcome to come and do the action the next day. And not everybody comes, and that's perfectly fine because the bedrock of this is you have to understand that it can be very dangerous. People, I, you know, I don't mean to sound hyperbolic, but people have died doing these things um, around the world. That it, it, you don't do it to stay safe. Like there's a, a sort of strange idea that some people have a misapprehension that, oh, you take up nonviolence because you want to do something safer. And that's not. It's completely the opposite. You're putting yourself in danger on purpose. So this is not for everybody. If you do this, I want you to understand the level of danger you might be in. And you, you have to be prepared for that um, emotionally. You know, you, you have to have made peace with this before you do it. So we, we really do try to get everybody in the room. We, you know, we do our best to try to get them to, to grapple with that. So we talk about it as a group and, you know, we really just go around and make sure everybody's ready before we do it. Um, I want everybody's full participation and I want them to be aware of what's coming. So we, we show the movie, the freedom riders, if you've never seen it, watch freedom riders. It's an incredible documentary about those 12 people who got on those Greyhound buses and tried to desegregate public transportation throughout the deep South. And it was an amazing thing that they did. So they're all trained in nonviolent direct action and then they're let loose into the wild to just try it, right? And and there's not really black and white here. As long as you're holding to discipline, there's not like a game plan that will take you through step by step because everything goes crazy the moment you're in these situations. You can have the best plan in the world, but the moment the mob comes down on you, like anything can happen. So, you know, they get on the buses and then it starts out very slowly and it seems okay, but, <laughs> but it gets worse and worse the deeper into the South they get. And a number of them are beaten near half to death, you know, multiple times, there's incredible amounts of violence against them. And they make these amazing strategic decisions to get it done. And the movie is, I can't, I mean, it's two hours long and you will be just be crying at multiple points because these people were so brave, but they were also so smart. Like they figured out how to use this technique. And I feel the same here that it's like, we're giving women this, you know, the, the background here, like, what is the technique? How does it work? Why is nonviolent discipline important? Right. What, what is the thing here? Like, what's the fulcrum? So having explained it to them in the best way that I know how, watch the film. We then try to put it to use. OK, so here we are all sitting in a room. What do we think about this? How do you all feel about it? Can you do this? What are you afraid of? Uh, do you understand what we might be up against tomorrow? I've seen the hatred in these men's eyes. I mean, some of them would kill us if they could. And again, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. I just know who they are. And I know the number of times they've assaulted me. And I see the kinds of things they put online. And um, yeah, it's a lot of them are really not nice human beings. And I would say some of them are out and out sociopaths. So mm. anyway, that's who we're up against. Um, and the police basically don't do anything. So, all right. So <laughs> we've been doing these trainings around. Um, go ahead, Jennifer. Can I ask a question? quick question? I sure. know, Lena, that, you know, having talked with you and with the presentation that we're going to connect to as part of this green flame, where you go into great depth about nonviolent civil disobedience, that you are long familiar. You've had a long experience with this in your life. And you mention schools in that presentation, that there used to be schools that you could go to. Yep. You're doing this pretty rapidly. So yeah. um, is there a necessity for that as well? And how long do you train when you're in a school as the people did in the civil rights movement? Well, I really wish that we had a Highlander, you know, for feminists. Um, the Highlander Institute uh, was called the Highlander Folk School originally. And that was the center of the civil rights movement. It was founded in 1932. They were using the Danish folk school move movement as a, 
um, a template. And then there were Americans who learned about it and they studied there. And then they came to the United States, back to the United States, and they set up this school in Tennessee. And they really wanted to train people for the labor movement and for anti-poverty movements. But it turned out that the civil rights movement was really who needed them. So they trained all of the luminaries of the civil rights movement. Anyone you could name went through Highlander. And that was how they learned to do NBDA. So Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Ralph Abernathy, the Freedom Riders, all of them had been through the Highlander program. So you'd go for a week or two and you would really get a, a deep, deep grounding in this technique and how it worked. Um, and you would practice. So there's footage of people, you know, before they got on the buses for the Freedom Rides, before the they did the sit-ins at the uh, the lunch counters, like in North Carolina, and how that spread, you know, all across the South. They did these really intensive trainings to try to get people ready. Like, this is what's going to happen to you. What do you think? How is what's your response going to be? Can you hold the discipline or not? How does it feel to be screamed at like this? You know, how does it feel to have people push you and shove you and knock you over? And um, you know, potentially stomp on your head. I, people got really injured doing these things. And in the, you know, the Freedom Summer, when they were registering the voters, there were people who got killed. So it's very serious when you confront power. I just want everybody to understand that. It's, this is not, a, you know, an undertaking for the weak-willed. You, you really have to be in. Yeah. So anyway, the, the trainings were quite serious during the civil rights movement for obvious reasons. And people really were up against a, a life-threatening situation. And it, you know, a lot of times it's like, 10 people and there's a mob of 200 screaming racists who have baseball bats and pipes and really mean it. And that, you know, they got beaten their half to death more than once. So it's, it is quite serious. Uh, so they tried to prepare you as much as possible for this, but it also, you know, made a really wonderful culture of resistance around all the people who went to Highlander and then all the things they did together <laughs> when they got out of Highlander um, doing things like the Freedom Rides, there's, you know, permanent bond if you if you undertake an action like that, something that's very serious and certainly life threatening. They, they created a very beautiful culture. And, you know, a lot of them stayed friends for the rest of their lives. So uh, it's, you know, it's an intense thing, but it's a really good thing. And it's obviously deeply meaningful to people to be a part of something that, you know, you feel like you're, you're changing history in a, in a very good way. You know, they like to use that phrase about on the side of you're on the side of history, but I'm a little tired of that because <laughs> that's being used against us as if we're the fascists. And I'm, I'm just it's been, it's it's just been wrecked for me. But if it still means something to you, then please use it. But, yeah, you know, we're citizens of the world and we have a responsibility to, to make things better. And we see injustice everywhere. And, you know, this is a cause that I can't back away from. So and I know there's other women who feel the same. They just lack the tools. So, you know, when I was coming up as a very young feminist, yeah, I, I didn't go to Highlander. But I mean, we had things like the Greenham Common, the Women's Peace Camp there. And then we had the American version, which was Seneca. Um, and I went to both of those and I got an incredible political education in nonviolent direct action. That's what those places were for. And I learned so much from the women who were there. And most, mostly the women who had set it up were, you know, the generation before me. And they had been through the civil rights movement. They were active participants in these struggles. They'd been through the, the Vietnam War, the, the protests against the war. And they understood nonviolent direct action. They, they got this as a concept. And that was who I learned it from. So it's a direct transmission from them to me. Um, I'm not sure that I quite understood it. I mean, I did civil disobedience myself. I was arrested six times in my life. I couldn't tell you each time exactly why we were doing it. Like, I think that a lot of the intellectual, you know, the kind of study that, that right. I went to later and I like, really absorbed this technique and what it meant and just read everything I could find and watched all the documentaries and just, I mean, it took a decade for me to really come to grips with it. Um, and then finally I was convinced. I was like, all right, I see, actually, I see the, the wisdom of this and I see that it is successful. And then, you know, like the Soviet Union fell and all of those, almost entirely, those people won their freedom using nonviolence. And I was alive for that, like watching one by one, those countries use this technique uh, was extraordinary. I mean, it's so inspiring. So, you know, I, it, I really encourage everybody to look into this because literally millions of people in my lifetime have figured this out. There's no reason we can't use this for, as a, a feminist technique as well. So it would be so <laughs> great if we had like a place where you could go for a week or two. I have no idea how we would fund that. But if there's anybody listening who has that kind of money, who finds this thing inspirational and, and you, you want to get in touch, oh, we would, I would, in a heartbeat, I would help set that up. It would be an amazing thing. We really need that. So we just took it on the road instead. I was like, all right, we don't have that. We don't have the, the resources for that. But we can travel. So a small group of us has been going around the country and training anybody who wanted the training. It's free. You know, you can just come and learn and you don't have to do the action afterwards. 
And I really want to emphasize this. You don't have to put yourself at risk. You don't have to do this thing that is really terrifying at times. Um, but I do want everybody to understand it because then you can, you can support it. You can support those of us who are doing it. You can try to explain it to others who maybe are confused about it. There's so many myths and misunderstandings about NVDA. And I just really want our culture resistance to be well-grounded in the theory of this so that we can do it successfully. So that's one of the reasons we've been going around doing it. So um, we did, some of it was last year in Tacoma, about a year ago in Tacoma, Washington. There is a woman's prison there where they've been putting men and some of the most horrible men on the planet. There's serial sex killers in there. Um, horrendous, horrendous men are in that prison. And nobody seems to care what's happening to the women. And their stories are all horrible, as you might imagine. And I just want everyone to think about, put yourself in this position for 10 seconds. You are a woman, so you're five foot two. Uh, you're in an eight by 10 cell, locked in a room, eight by 10. And they are about to put a convicted rapist in the room with you. This is what women are going through around the country and in fact, around the world. These are the men that are going into the women's prison. I don't know why anybody thinks this is okay, but this is why I'm never gonna stop because I cannot sleep at night. It makes me so upset and so angry. So we're also, we also have lawsuits. My group is Wolf, the Women's Liberation Front, and we are suing the state of California on behalf of the women in the prison. And you can read all about that on our website and we would love your help and your support if that's something that you wanna get done. Um, we can absolutely use whatever you've got, but in the meantime, we're also doing this, we're doing direct action. So anyway, we went to Tacoma and, and there were various things that happened last fall in the Pacific Northwest. There were different actions that, that happened um, and some of them were very successful and some of them I would consider not so successful. <laughs> but a lot of it was this, this problem where women just didn't understand what we were up against and the fact that, all right, this is a direct confrontation of power. How do we do this well? And the way to do this well, especially when you have nothing on your side, is non-voluntary action. And they, they, don't, they didn't know that. So we've been trying to get through to them. So, and that's great because a lot of women were very, very interested in it. And so we have done this training, you know, a bunch of times. So the first really successful action we did was in Oakland, California. And this was because there's a man named, oh God, well, he goes by Dana Rivers, but his original name was David. And he, um, he murdered a lesbian couple in Oakland. The judge said it was the most brutal thing he'd ever seen. This is like the level of deranged violence that he inflicted on particularly one of the women um, and then also their teenage son. So, and, and also one of the women's black and one is white. So it's an interracial couple. You'd think that this would be a cause celeb, that this you know biracial lesbian couple and their black teenage son is murdered. Nobody cared because the man who did it thinks he's a woman and they're like this sacred caste that nobody is allowed to criticize. So nothing happened around this murder trial. Uh, eventually he was found guilty. I mean, the evidence was absolutely overwhelming. He was found on the scene, trying to burn their house down to you know, disguise the evidence, but it was obvious who had done it. So he's found guilty. And of course he's sent to the women's prison because it's California. So the women there are now having to live with this horrendous man who has already proved how deranged and violent he is. So that's terrible. So on the steps of the courthouse in Oakland where this trial was being held, so then on Monday, we did the action because we waited for the courthouse to be open. So we planned the action. Everybody is trying to be aware of what's coming. Everybody seems like they're, you know, as prepared as we can be. You know, we also just don't know. Like sometimes we're able to do these things and there's not much response. And other times it's like a complete explosion of crazy shit. So it's like, who knows? Could be fine. Could be awful. You could get hurt. It could be nothing. We just don't know. So anyway, we had beautiful banners, we gave speeches, all of this is online if you wanna go see what we did. Some of the speeches are very moving. And then um, because we were on the courthouse steps, of course, there's sheriffs and police coming and going up and down the stairs. So we could see the, you know, the Antifa, what we call Trantifa is there on the corner. There's a group of them gathered and they clearly aim to do us harm, but they're not gonna do anything while there's police coming and going. Like They're, they're cowards, they're not gonna hurt us while there's law enforcement there. So they're waiting to see what happens. So we're done with our talks and we thought, well, we'll go down to the, the street. There's a big street at the bottom of the courthouse, a major kind of thoroughfare. So I was like, well, let's, let's let people see our banner. So we went and we said no males in women's prisons and we had a you know, big banner. So we stood there with the banner and everybody who drove by honked and waved and we got nothing but support from the people in the cars. And I'm gonna say why very bluntly is that Oakland is a majority black city. 
and we know who's in prison in the women's prison. It's, it's overwhelmingly women of color. It's their girlfriends and daughters and sisters and mothers who are in those prisons having to deal with these horrendous violent men. It's their, you know, those are the women who are being sacrificed to this horrible ideology and they know it. So every last man who drove by honked and waved at us. And it's horrendous. Again, it's like, you know, the most vulnerable women in the world. It's the least of us. And nobody cares because they're black. And I'm sorry, how do we not see the racism in this? Anyway, put my rage aside. <laughs> Move on with the story. So we had our banners and that was great. And then we went across the street to the park. There's a really nice little park at Lake Merritt. And we were just going to hold silent vigil for the women in the prison who were now going to be suffering with this man, hold up our banners. And of course, that's when they decide, okay, they're far enough away from the police. We can do our thing. So they came and they attacked us and they threw stuff at our heads and they hit us and they punched us and they hit us, tried to, they ran us over with their bicycles and they had umbrellas and just this whole thing takes place. And they stole our banner. They ripped the banner out of our hands. And I really highly, highly encourage everyone to, there's video you can watch. I highly encourage you to watch that video because there was a woman there with her dog who came up to talk to us and she was on their side to start with. She's worked in the, I don't know what her name is. She had worked in the, the criminal justice system in some capacity. She didn't say, but she was very concerned about poor Mr. Dana Rivers and what was going to happen to him in the men's jail and how it wasn't safe for him. Of course, you know, she's using the pronouns, which none of us do. I refuse to submit to the pronouns, not going to do it. Uh, but she's, you know, calling this horrible man a her. Uh, and then, but she's, you know, she's dialogue. I mean, we're dialoguing. It's not, she's not screaming at us. I mean, it was a perfectly reasonable discussion. And then the assault happens. So this gang of men comes and punches us and hits us and, you know, does their thing. And she com she's so upset for us, so angry. And she's spluttering. What is going on? What are they doing? Oh, this is terrible. This, what is happening here? And then she's like, your First Amendment rights. You have rights to free speech. I'm like, there it is. She Yay. gets it. <laughs> she's got she's it. This is it. Like, this is it. This is, it's been called our, this our American, our civic religion is the First Amendment. It's so central to our character. It's the, it's the first thing she goes to is you have First Amendment rights. Yes, you're right. We do. This is like what's supposed to be good about this country is we have a First Amendment. And this is being taken away from us by this violent mob. And she was horrified. So the fun part is you see her peak in real time. We could not have paid this woman right, to respond <laughs> better. She's just an average woman. But this is how the technique works. When you right. show the average person that a violent mob of men is going to come and attack absolutely peaceful women saying perfectly normal things, right? Trying to defend women and children. Just there we are, just, just perfectly calm, stalwart, in our dignity, trying to say things that we should be allowed to say out loud. And what happens? They descend upon us. And this woman is utterly outraged on our behalf. And this is how it works. And this is why it's important to stick to nonviolent discipline. So we got to see it in real life. So please, everybody go watch that. Yes. Is it up on YouTube? Is it over? Yeah, it's w on YouTube. W it's on the WDI USA website. Okay, good. We can put in the good. link in the links in the, the show notes. We can, I can send you the link for that. That would be so perfect. That was really, I thought that was incredibly successful. And then there was some media that picked it up too. So, I mean, it's always the right wing, right? The left wing will not deal with this. We have not had a breakthrough really into the mainstream media, but the kind of right wing stuff. So Fox news, there were a number of shows that, they had it on a loop that day. They showed that assault over and over again. Um, and then some of us got to talk um, on those. I mean, they're national programs. You know, there's millions of people who got to hear about it. So that, you know, I mean, I wish that the left wing people were on the side of women. They're not. The day will come when they have to deal with this. We, we don't know when it will be, but we have to keep at it until we have that breakthrough and we can have a national conversation. But until then, there's going to be violent mobs of men beating up women on the streets of America. So here we are. Um, so they, they did really well. Um, everybody held to discipline and it, I was so proud of all of them. And we really had, it was, I mean, we just, we feel very jubilant after these things. We feel like, you know, we got it done. We were brave. Um, you know, we stuck together. We have our solidarity with each other. We're doing this for the women in prison. We're doing this for the women in the better women shelters. We have to stand up for women and we did it. So it, you, you do feel like, you know, it toughens you up each time. So it's, it's, it's a, if you can do it, it's a good thing to do. You will build courage. Courage is a muscle. And each time you face these men down, you build more courage. So we, we were pretty happy with how it went. So then um, we did, we've done a few more since then. So we did one in Florida that was really great. And then we also did one in New York City on Mother's Day. We went to the UN and we did, the whole event was around the rights of mothers. 
that mothers are adult human, <laughs> adult human female parents. That's the, you know, we give birth. We are the people who do that. It is not the men. We all know the difference. Stop pretending. Do not give in to these men. It's ridiculous. There's not a human being on the planet who does not know the difference between men and women. So yeah, we had, we had really wonderful speeches. You can watch the speeches again online. There were some Trantifa who came to hurt us. Um, there weren't very many of them. And also the New York City police knew that we were going to be there and they sent a car. So there was a squad car waiting right there. And I think that that was a, a, a massive deterrent. They're bullies, you know, like they, they won't do it if there are police present. So they did harass us, but they didn't do much to us physically. Um, most of it was they waited until our speeches were done. And then we went to stand on the corner with our banners. And so they tried to obstruct our banners from the street so that the pedestrians couldn't see us. Um, and so that was kind of fun because the leader of our pack for the day is the one and only Jessica Gonzalez. And she led them on a merry dance through the street. So it was really fun to watch that. It was very playful. Um, and we had pedestrians come up to us and say, wow, um, I know a little bit about this and I'd like to know more. And I think it's horrible. What I understand about this is that it's terrible. And um, they had various perspectives, but they were all good. And they could see what the men were doing, trying to stop our banners from being seen by the traffic. And they were mad about that on our behalf. Again, it was, you have First Amendment rights. Why are they allowed to do this to you? I don't care what your banner says. You're allowed to stand here and have a banner. This is what America is supposed to be about. This is what democracy is. We, we make our, our thoughts known and we exchange ideas. And then we come to some kind of conclusion altogether so that we don't use violence on each other. Like we've got two options here as humans. We can talk about it or we can hit each other. And I, I don't know why hitting each other has ended up being the option everybody is defaulting to on the left. I thought that the left was made of different stuff and I'm still very confused about the last decade. Anyway, uh, New York was good with the time. Everybody had a good, we had a good training and women were very committed. So we uh, went to the, the Liberty Plaza in Philadelphia. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I just said you went to Philadelphia next. So what? Yeah, it, it, so that was in July we went to that Philadelphia? That was July, mid, mid was year. Okay. <laughs> my, my dad, okay. I grew up in Philadelphia. My dad was like, why are you doing this in July? <laughs> I know it's going to be hot. I know. <laughs> anyway, he's totally on my side. Actually, it's a kind of a cute story. I was there. I was like, I went to visit him first and then I went to do the training. And, you know, we had a long talk about all of this. And he's, you know, very much, he's like, this, the world's just gone crazy. And then the next morning he came down as I was packing my stuff to go. He's like, he had read some article. He'd seen something. He's like, do you understand? Do you know what they're saying about women? And I'm like, probably I've heard this, but what is it, dad? And he goes, they're talking about black birthing bodies. I'm like, yes, that is what they have called black women. Yes. He was so upset. It's just the rage. <laughs> it's just the dehumanization of these women. I'm like, yes, I know. It is horrible. That's why I'm in this fight. He couldn't get over it though. I mean, he just kept saying it over and over. It's like, this is the most horrendous thing he's ever heard. Well, it's horrible. How is this being normalized that you would say that about a mother, about a pregnant woman? She's not a birthing body. And of course they tried it out on black women first to see if everybody would just accept it. We're not accepting it. It's wrong. You can't call us that. Anyway, my dad is totally on side. So we did a really great training. It's a really wonderful group. It's always high spirits, lots of laughter. You know, you get to know everybody and it you just it's so fun just to be in that group with a serious purpose and yet we have so much fun so you get to experience both things um and it's you know very intellectually challenging as well There's lots of good questions you know the all the gray area in the middle what if i defend another woman is that are we breaking nonviolent discipline like it's a really good question uh what if i defend myself like what what counts as fighting back because we're not supposed to we're not supposed to hit back so what can i do what can i do we have to work it out as a group because it's gray area you know, I want us all to come to a, a conclusion together. It's not like I'm, I've got all the answers here on high. I don't, there's not a stone tablet, you know, that I'm passing down here. We we have to figure it out. So it's, they're great discussion. So Liberty Plaza is literally, it's there. That's where Constitution Hall is, where they signed the Declaration of Independence. And there's an area that's like this brief free speech area that anybody can rent. And you can rant and rave to the public about whatever your issue is. So we went, we had a permit, we did it all. And of course, the death threats had been rolling in, you know, for weeks against us. And the it's protected by the Philadelphia police, but also the park police, because it's a national park. Uh, Constitution Liber um, Independence Hall is considered, it's a national monument. So it's protected by two different groups of people, which can make it a little difficult when there's trouble. 
anyway, a, a rather large mob of horrible men came to scream at us. And they did. They were there the whole time. And they always wear masks and they're all in black and they look like Darth Vader and they've got sunglasses. You can't see their faces. And they, they do that so that they can't be identified because they do intend to break the law and hurt us. And also because uh, I assume they think it's scary. I mean, I think that they look like rather silly little boys, but you know, that's me. <laughs> I've faced them down enough that I know what they're made of. Um, anyway, there was a whole bunch of them screaming and yelling and they were, they threw stuff. They hit me in the head with a bottle, you know, they just sort of the usual. And then we did give our speeches, but I mean, you, you can't hear them. It, there was such screaming noise and they love to use those. They have those sirens that you can buy that are noisemakers. The decibel level on those is illegal. It's ear splitting pain when you, when you ha are subjected to that. And we did have earplugs, but I still had nerve deafness for a few days. Like just that horrible ringing in your ear where you can't quite hear. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a low level of torture. And I don't know why they're allowed to do that because it is illegal. And it really, it's always confusing to me what the police do and don't do. Sometimes they're there and they're great. Other times they don't show up and other times they come, but they don't do much. So in this case, it's like they were good about some things. I don't understand why they let the noisemakers go on because at other demonstrations, they have absolutely made them stop. It's like, this is an illegal level of noise. You cannot do this. And they, they take them away. This time they didn't do that. So we were just you know, the pounding noise the whole time. But the scary part is when you have to leave because we had to get away from the park and then down to the street to get in um, our cars to get away. And uh, they, of course, that's the moment that they're waiting for because they can mob us. So we were surrounded by this horrible mob the whole way. And then we were sort of stuck on the street corner waiting for the, our rides to come to, to take us back. And when we were just pinned to this brick wall for at least 10 minutes, it was probably longer and they were right up against us. So the police at that point were really good to us. They, they made, a, they just physically made a barrier with their bodies between us and the screaming mob. But then they were right in our faces. It was, I mean, we were only about, you know, the width of a human body apart from us. Um, and the, well, they were, and they had a bullhorn too. So they were screaming in my ear. And so on that side, my left side, I, it was, it was like when a bomb goes off, what, you know, you hear about that, like you can't hear for two days. That ear was like just gone for a while. Um, and I knew that it would be fine. Like I wasn't scared of it. Like I've, I've been through these kinds of things enough. It's like, yeah, yeah, this is a thing. Um, they, they haven't ruptured my membrane or anything. So it's not, wasn't that level of pain, but you know, it's definitely a little bit disconcerting not to be able to hear for two days out of that ear. So, and it hurts. I mean, it's just really painful when they scream at you with a bullhorn right in your ear and they know what they're doing. Like they mean to hurt us. It's very sadistic. So anyway, that happened. We, we got away without any real serious harm that time. Uh, and then we did San Francisco. So WDI USA had a really wonderful conference in San Francisco uh, it was in September. And we intended to do the training on Sunday and then a, a action at City Hall in San Francisco on the Monday. So, but the, they all, they, the, the Trantifa people knew that we were there all weekend. It was, you know, a public conference, anybody could come. So they came to the hotel where it was happening and there was a mob of them. I don't know, maybe about 200 of them at the top outside all day, Saturday, um, screaming, yelling, bullhorns. They graffitied the hotel. They tried to, the, one of these guys brought a hammer with him, which I'm sorry, that was clearly meant for our heads, but we, the, the, Organizers of the event asked everybody, do not engage with the protesters. It is not helpful. Let the police and hotel security deal with them. They have a plan. They know what they're doing. Don't make this any worse. Just, just leave them alone. So none of us really had much engagement with what was going on outside. There was like a, an upper level where we could go outside and look at them. So we would do that on occasion just to see what they were up to. They had some horrible signs that we got good footage of. So like 1 million dead TERFs was what we're, we're supposed to be TERFs. That's their, their slang term for us that dehumanizes and monsters us. So it said a million dead TERFs. So stuff like that is like, you know, clearly violent slogans. Um, and also a little bit disconcerting because they know who I am. Like when they caught sight of me on the upper level, they would start screaming my name. <laughs> so it's just like this really weird experience to be, have like 200 people screaming your name because they want you to die. It's just like, well, this is just weird. Like how is this my life? I don't know. It's just strange. I was not pre quite prepared for that one, but next time I'll be more prepared. I mean, it wasn't like I melted down, but it was just like weird, like, okay. Um, all right. This, this is a thing now. So anyway, mostly it was pretty good. People didn't much engage with what was going on out there. Um, they did, um, 
various ones of them tried to infiltrate the hotel. So there's stupid stories about that. But finally we did get to, oh, the guy with the hammer. So he brought a hammer. When he wasn't getting any satisfaction on our bodies, he decided he was going to attack the hotel. So he took the hammer and he started beating the sign, the hotel sign. And the manager of the hotel saw it. And it's basically his property. So he wasn't happy about that. And he ran outside to try to stop him. He got punched. The guy punched him, just full on, punched him in the face, knocked him over. And that was on video. So I don't really know if there's been charges pressed or if there's a court case about that. And he punched the guy in the face. But I will say that every time they do this, every single person who works in that hotel is fully peaked to our side because they punch the manager in the face. Like they behaved horribly all weekend by screaming and yelling, making their lives really hard, you know, behaving in ways that were really threatening and scary to the hotel workers. And then they punched the guy in the face and knocked him over. It was like, you can't, you're not going to make, this is not how you convince people to your argument. You're just going to make no, people. It doesn't seem as if there's any strategy behind it. It's just full on rage. Yeah. It's full on rage and violence. Yeah, that's and exactly they're making what they it so yep. obvious that it is that true that everywhere you've gone, people yes. have peaked absolutely just by watching, just by watching it. I mean, they do our work for us. All right. we have to do is just be reasonable, calm people, making reasonable, calm demands, and it and it's done. It's mm. just like the you know the the four young guys who sat down at that first lunch counter in North Carolina, a perfectly reasonable demand. We just want a cup of coffee. Um, so that's like. You know, the stated goal, we just want a cup of coffee. The strategic goal is, of course, to show the horrors of white racism in the Deep South, which they did very successfully, because within three days, there were mobs of these horrible white men punching them, pouring hot coffee on them, putting cigarettes out on their bodies, dragging them off stools, um, you know, stomping on them, just making an, a, it was a horrible, violent scene. So the world had to see it. Um, and it's the same thing here. I mean, it's the exact same process. It's, so that's 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 so that's what happened in San Francisco. So then we we plan the action. Everybody's in. A number of women decide they're not going to come. And I just want to say one more time, it's perfectly fine that those women decided this is not for me. I can take a supporting role because we need so many supporters <laughs> to get this done. It is so much work to put this on, and we really need help in the background too. And and all of these roles need to be filled to make it successful. So don't do this if you're not prepared for it. And please do something else. Do the thing that you really want to do that you're impassioned about. So um, we, yeah, we had a great action. We went downtown, we had the permits that we needed. Um, we set up right in front of city hall and we read speeches that the theme of that one was trying to support lesbian women because this movement is so homophobic. Lesbians are called bigots and fascists and every kind of name because lesbians don't want to sleep with men. They do not want to have sex with somebody who has a penis. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's they're being told that this is, quote, lady dick and that they should literally suck it. That's what women are told over and over again. Suck my lady dick. That is one of their slogans. You can look at it online if you don't believe me. And this is just um, it's just just horrifying. Like, you know, I, I, don't even, I don't even have words for this anymore. It is so horrendous. And so here we are in San Francisco trying to do mm -hmm. an event to support lesbians. And these, you know, the same thing. There's this horrible mob of men come and start screaming at us. Um, for saying that lesbians shouldn't have to have sex with men. We get screamed at for this. Uh, the police were very good. They were there to you know, keep the peace and they put up a barrier between us. Um, if the police hadn't been there, there certainly would have been violence. There was enough of them that they would have crossed the line. Uh, they didn't, but um, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a high stress situation where you're being screamed at for an hour. We, we got all of our um, talks on, on video. So we have, we have good footage. So if anybody wants to see those speeches, some of them are very, very moving speeches. And then um, we were able to successfully extract ourselves and, and leave. So that happened. It was a good one. I think a lot of women learned some things there that had never done this before. Because like I said, it is high stress. Um, I will say that there was a young woman who was listening very intently. And it was heartbreaking to see her because she's clearly had a double mastectomy. She's clearly on testosterone. And something in what we were saying was reaching her because she came around the barrier and she stood right in front of us and just stared while we were talking. She wasn't there to scream at us or, you know, to yell, you know, horrible things at us or to try to provoke us. She just stood there stock still with her eyes wide open, just listening. And it broke my heart because she just looked like 
you know, you put me back in time 40 years. She's like every lesbian I knew when I was 20, that's what she looked like, except she's had her breast removed. And she thinks that this is some way out to freedom and it's not. So I'm hoping that our speech has reached her and that as time rolls on and she questions more and more what's been done to her and her perfect body, um, that she'll remember those speeches and that she'll find us because she is a woman and is always welcome in our sisterhood. Always. You cannot leave womanhood. You will always be a woman. And I want her to embrace her female body and know that she is loved. So I don't know. I don't know if we got through to her in that moment or if she's still thinking about it now. I don't know what her name is. It just, it was incredibly moving to, I mean, I read my speech to her essentially when I was talking because I just wanted her to realize all of that, that, that there's a better way here and you can join women and fight fight for women rather than fight your own body. So anyway, that was for me very, very personally moving. So um, so we did that one. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, so then came um, the, the last one was that we did was in Portland, Oregon. So um, we knew it was going to be bad because, you know, Portland is the center of a lot of this. It's Portland used to be such a wonderful place. All of these little cities in the Pacific Northwest used to be just really wonderful places to be it was we all felt like we had similar values and there were always really strong feminist communities women's communities it's all over now i mean there's there's nothing left of any of it and this sort of authoritarian left has taken over um it's a completely different value system than than what i thought the left was about and they absolutely believe in shutting people up who you don't agree with in any any way that you think is appropriate and they celebrate violence them they think that it's a good thing and you know it all started with quote punch a nazi but the problem is everybody's a nazi right it was always a bad idea to have that as a slogan but basically anyone they don't like anyone they don't agree with they can now brand you a nazi and they are allowed to hit you and everyone will celebrate it so that's what portland has become and then they quote defunded their police so now there's not even really much of a functioning police force so any crime that happens unless it's like an active murder taking place um they, there's just no police response so we knew that going in and we wanted to do it anyway so one of our uh, one of the core members of our of our little group said that portland is our birmingham and it is it was where the worst stuff was bound to happen so you know we have to go there it's the belly of the beast now we're into portland so the week before we were going to do a talks at a library we have done a number of these events very successfully where we have a room at a library it could not get more American. Any American is allowed to rent a public room in a library. If they have meeting space, they have to be viewpoint neutral. The Supreme Court has ruled on this three times, not once, not twice, three times. If they have a room, it has to be viewpoint neutral because it's, it's a government place. And so they're not allowed to have a perspective. And this includes groups that you and I would hate. It doesn't matter. The Ku Klux Klan right. is allowed to rent a room in yeah. a library. Okay. It's absolute in the United States. We have free speech. So the, 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 you know, the, the response to the Ku Klux Klan is that, I mean, the, 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 the response that would actually be useful would be, A, to de-radicalize people, uh, B, to keep them from ever joining those groups, so to find out why are people so desperate that they need a scapegoat. And there are people who have spent their lives studying this and figuring out how to reach exactly those people. The problem is the left has turned their back on those people. We call them deplorables now. We call them Trump voters and we hate them rather than trying to understand. You know, why have they turned to this this direction in their lives? They are reachable. There's people who do that. Um, some very famously have reached into hate groups and gotten people out of them and turned them into activists, you know, on the side of good. It's not impossible to do this, but the left doesn't want to do it anymore. We don't want to educate people. We just want to scream at them and then punch them if we don't agree with them. Um, I don't know how to fix this. <laughs> it just seems completely out of control. Anyway, um, so we rented a room at a library and we were going to give speeches. And the theme of the day was protecting women and children. So just generally, you know, violence against women and children. What are we going to do about it? This seems to be like a perfectly legitimate thing that we should be able to talk about. So that's the stated goal is that, you know, we want to be able to have these talks about protecting women and children. So this is my life's work. I would rather be doing this than anything else. Um, so then we got a call from the library, essentially the security force. Uh, they have noticed all of this internet fervor about us, that there are threats being made online, on Twitter, against us, that they are threatening to assault us. Um, all kinds of scary things are, are floating around out there, and they want to make sure that we know about it, and they want to tell us that they know about it, and that they are prepared to do what they can to make it a safe event. They are not asking us to cancel, and I was very pleased that the library was taking the correct 
path on this because there's other libraries that haven't been so cool about it. Um, so that was good. And we said, yes, of course, we're going to go on with our event. All right. So we all get to Portland. Some people live there. It's about half the group lived there. Well, probably more than half the group, actually, because they're at the end of the day, they were probably 20, 25 women who participated in at least some of it. Um, and most of them lived in the, in the area. Some of us from far away. I'm, I'm a six hour drive from Portland. So anyway, we arrive on Friday. And the next thing we hear from the security is that there's a mandated reporter in Portland who has heard from a client who is clearly a disturbed young man. Um, and what this young man has said to him is that he is, uh, he has a gun. He's going to come to our event and quote, if anybody messes with me, I'm going to use it. And the mandated reporter understands his job. So he called the security and he reported that this was a threat that was being made. And I don't know what happened next. I hope that somebody intervened and took the gun away. That's how those laws are supposed to work. That if you are threatening violence and you are, you know, in some way psychologically unstable, that you should not be allowed to have this gun, at least for now. So I don't know what happened, but hopefully that was set in motion. All I know is that we were told about it. And then the same question was asked, do you want to go on? So we took it to the whole group and we explained to them what we knew. Everybody there said that they still wanted to do it. But we also felt a responsibility to tell anybody who might be coming to the event. So we immediately wrote up a statement and we put it out on social media to tell anybody who might be coming that we had reason to believe there might be a gun and it might be used and that this is a whole other level of violence. And, you know, please be aware what you're getting into. Um, and I don't know. I don't know whether that it's very hard to know who you're trying to reach because somebody can see something on social media saying, oh, it was an event at a library. Maybe I'll go to that. And you don't see the rest of it. Like if you haven't checked in on the right social media accounts, you're not going to know that there's been gun violence in it. I don't know what to do about that. Right. We're sort of at an impasse here with that. So we did our best to get the word out. And there were also different groups, sort of more informal groups in Portland that we knew had heard about this. There were different feminist groups. So we tried to get the word out to all of them. Like, please spread this into your networks that this man has threatened to bring a gun. So just so everybody knows what they're getting into. So that happened. <laughs> the training went really well. It was a really lively group as usual. I love doing these trainings. We have such a good time. Um, we all go to bed on Saturday. We usually rent a place to all be together so that we have a space to do the training. And then women who don't live there or don't want to travel at all can have a place to stay overnight. So we'd rent it an Airbnb. And the next thing we know, Sunday morning, we wake up and our tires have been slashed in the night. So they have found out where we are. And then we go online and indeed they know where we are and they've infiltrated one of our meetings and they've put up, they've recorded the Zoom meeting where we're all talking about it and they've put it all over. So anybody go watch the meeting. We don't say anything weird. I'm perfectly fine with everything we said in that meeting. Yes, we are planning nonviolent direct action. All right, we're allowed to do that. We are not breaking any laws, people. This is our right. So you're the people who are assaulting us. We're not doing anything to you. Anyway, um, all of that was all online. So I was like, oh, okay, so they know where we are. I don't care. I'm not afraid of them. It's, I know it's slightly unnerving and it's meant to be scary. That's why they came and do it. They come and they do it in the night. They want us to be afraid. It's a tactic of utter bullies. All right, fine. You came and you did that. I don't, I don't care. We're still going on. So Kara and I did two little videos about that. It's just telling them that we're not afraid and we're not going to be bullied. You know, we intend to go on with our event, so all good. And then we get another call from the library. They have, in the night, also vandalized the library. And I just want to ask, what kind of a psycho vandalizes a public library? They broke the glass on the front door, and then they spray painted everywhere. So just let that settle in, people. That's who you're dealing with, people who have that level of antisocial behavior. Okay, my mom was a librarian, so maybe I'm taking this a little more personally, but I would hope that everybody in America would be pretty horrified by this. It's libraries are the, one of the institutions that do the most public good in terms of civic life. I, where would we be without libraries? You need a place to talk and to think and to read and to engage with ideas. And this is what libraries do. They get information to people who need it, which is to say every single citizen. And it is horrifying to me that anybody thinks it's okay to attack a library for doing something as basic as providing meeting space for citizens to talk about things. We don't have a democracy if we don't have that. And I want people on the left to get their shit together and realize what is going on here. Okay, this is who you've seceded the movement to. 
And if this, this is what you want is left-wing authoritarianism. I don't know. It's not what I signed up for anyway. So we get this call, they've broken the library. They've you know done all this. Do we want to go forward? We're like, yes, of course we're going to go forward. Nothing's going to stop us. So they say, all right, just wait. We're going to secure the space for you. We will keep you updated. All right. So then we get another call. All right, it's time to come get, get in your transportation. So we had vans that we had rented. We get in the vans and we, we start driving toward the library. And as we're driving down the street, it's really clear that the Antifa people have put up centuries on the corners of where we're staying because we can see them there. And they're like, you know, furiously talking into their phones. Oh, they've left. I just think this is so ridiculous. What did they think they were going to see? Like, of course we were going to our event. Like they knew where we were going. It wasn't a secret. It was perfectly public. We were having a public event at a public library. That one just cracked me up. It still makes me laugh. Like, and if we decided not to go, what would you yeah. have seen? That we didn't leave? Like, all right, we wouldn't <laughs> have turned up. Like you would have known that anyway. I just, the secret spy games, like, oh, they just got to be like, you know, the players with the side quest, whatever. Anyway, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> so we drove and then we, we were almost there. We got another call. And then they said, just wait where you are. We're going to come and talk to you. So the head librarian, the head security came to talk to us. And what they wanted to tell us was there is a screaming mob outside the library. There's like, you know, a whole bunch of them. They're circling the building. We had a terrible time getting our staff into the building um, without them getting physically assaulted. Who assaults a library worker? Why would you do that to somebody who works in a library? How is this useful in the world? These are like public servants. Like they're doing the Lord's work here. I don't understand it. Anyway, yeah, the perfectly innocent librarians who just want to get information to people and have, you know, story hour for kids. Uh, they're getting assaulted on the way into the library. So they wanted to tell us it was really hard to get the workers in. We're afraid for the staff. We have shut the library down to the public. The only thing it's open for is your event because we're trying to keep people out of the building because we don't know what's going to happen. We can't promise you that you'll be safe getting into the building. We have no idea how we're going to do this. You should also know that the, the upper floors of the building are um, housing. It's elderly housing up there. So there's old people coming and going all the time. There's also a cafe attached to the library. There's people in there like with their baby strollers, like reading the paper. Um, we just want you to know what's happening. We're not telling you what to do. You have a First Amendment right. We are here for it. But just know that, that there's some vulnerable people here. And so we very quickly made the decision. We're not putting all those people at risk. We're here for it. They're not. Like we've trained for this. We know we're about to do a direct confrontation with some fairly sadistic power. They don't know this. And they didn't say that this was okay. So I don't want to put those people at risk. It's People have to know what they're getting into. Sign up for this, be trained for this, and be prepared for it. That random old people living upstairs were not prepared for this. So we said, no, we're not going to go to the library. You have your library back. We're not doing anything to the library. But we are going to go ahead with our event. So we're going to stand here on the street corner, a block up from the library, and we're going to hold our banners, and we're going to read our speeches. That was our plan B the whole time. If we can't get into the library, we had tried to have some plan Bs here. Like, it all goes crazy, like, the moment the thing starts. Like, you just can't plan to that level, but we tried, you know, you always try. All right, if this goes wrong, we can try this. So we can't get into the library. We're gonna give our speeches on the street, no matter what, we're gonna give our speeches. So, all right, and then the, they said, okay, fine. The police are already at the library. They've been kind of circling the building the whole time. Uh, we're gonna tell them that you're up the street if trouble happens, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, well, all right, maybe we'll get some help from law enforcement. You, you never know, but maybe. So we were sort of hoping that that's sort of in the background there, like maybe it won't go crazy for too long, but we knew what was coming, so. All right, we get out, we walk a block, we're there, we can see the library down the street, we've got our banners, and we can hear them screaming. I mean, they're just this, they're, they're already like at, at 100. They've already like taken it to the top. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, I don't know how many kind of riot situations you've been in, but it takes time for human beings to get themselves revved up to that level, because they have to get out of their frontal lobes and back into that amygdala. They have to be feeling like some kind of really primal rage. Um, it actually takes a lot to get human human beings to hurt each other. Like the military goes through all kinds of things with their recruits to get them to be willing to kill people. And this has in fact been a real problem for militaries like way back to ancient Rome days that they couldn't get soldiers to kill each other. It's like, I don't have any beef with this guy from whatever, you know, like the barbarian tribes or like whoever they are. I, I don't know. It's, it's actually really hard. Um, and in fact, it's a total sidebar here, but it's one reason that the Vietnam vets 
had such high rates of PTSD was that the kill rate was really high because of the kind of uh, insane training they were put through, which they had never done to people before. Um, and so they, um, that's one reason is that they, that a lot of them really had killed people at a, at a much higher rate. And it, it, it does a terrible thing to human beings. Yeah. As, as we have found out, people who commit atrocities actually have way higher rates of PTSD than the people the, to whom the atrocities are done, setting aside sociopaths who are not like the rest of us. Um, anyway, they had themselves completely worked out because a lot of times it starts with the screaming and the yelling, like they're calling us names, they're dehumanizing us, they're monstering us. I get the psychological process. They have to do that first. And then they start throwing things. So you're hurting people at a distance. You're not even sure you're the one who did it. Uh, it's a lot easier to do it from a distance. The closer they get, the harder it is. Uh, and then they'll break through that barrier bit by bit. So they're encroaching on our personal space. And then if they're going to do violence, it really starts. But these guys, they were in immediately. So Kara Dansky gave a lovely introduction to what we were doing there. I was the first speaker. I got about halfway through, like maybe a minute into my talk. And at that point, the mob was on us. They were just running down the street screaming. They didn't, didn't hesitate at all. They were already there. So they started throwing things at us. They had like soda bottles filled with liquid. It's very heavy. Like it really hurts to get hit by one of those. I was hit by at least one. I'm not sure how many. Um, it's kind of a blur parts of what happened next. They threw firecrackers at us. I've never had firecrackers thrown at me. And that's terrifying because you can lose your hearing. You can lose your sight. You can lose a finger. You can catch on fire. That is like a really horrible thing to do to human beings. Who thinks it's okay for young men to throw firecrackers at middle-aged women? I don't, and older. There's women there who were grandmothers. Like what has happened to our culture? And that this is the culture of the left, like the people who are supposed to be on the good side. Uh, I just find utterly puzzling. So there was about 40 of them and about 10 of us. It's hard to tell because it happened really fast. And um, the what happened to me next? So we got hit with bottles. We get hit with firecrackers. They're screaming and yelling. They're running toward us full force. Uh, it's mostly young men. They look absolutely, I mean, they look terrifying. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It was terrifying. I mean, you'd be crazy not to be terrified. But the point is you do it anyway. You know, if you've decided to sign up for NBDA, then the goal is to be stalwart. So we were, everybody was very brave. But what happened next was there was a young man who had a canister, like if you can picture a small fire extinguisher, it was like that size. And it had a, a tube coming out of it, a hose. And then there was a nozzle on the top of it. And he just went and sprayed us in the eyes one by one by one. And I got a full force right in my eyes. That's the last thing I saw was his, his hand and that nozzle right in front of my eye. And then boom, the pain was excruciating. And then also they started punching and kicking me. So the next thing I knew, I was kind of on the ground next to this tree. There was a tree next to me and I'm just like curled up with my hands over my eyes. Like, like it, the pain was so bad. I was, I spent the next 10 minutes just trying not to vomit. It's just not going to make me vomit. I need to keep some dignity here. Like I don't want to vomit, but anyway, they're, it's just full on at that point. And so they're spraying women in the face. They're screaming and yelling. Not everybody got the pepper spray so bad. I think it was pepper spray because it was orange. I don't know for a fact, but I'm assuming that's what it was. And I'm, it hurt. So not everybody got it full on in the face, but it was everywhere at that point, just in the air. Like we were coughing, gagging, you couldn't breathe. So I couldn't see for like the next 10 minutes. I don't really know what happened. I could feel them punching and kicking me. They reached into my pocket and stole my phone. I could hear other women like crying and screaming somebody fell down next to me. I think it was a woman named Holiday. She got it pretty bad in the face too. There's some video of this. They took pretty much every phone they could see and they smashed them. So we don't have great video. There's a little bit of video that we do have. That was a, it was a camera that they couldn't, they didn't see. Uh, the camera is a little bit occluded, so it's not great video, but you can hear it. There's audio for it. It was just like a mob, just a madhouse. And so women are calling 911 and getting no response at all. We were promised that the police were right there. And of course they never turned up. So no police. All right. Well, we fought a plan C. Eventually my friend Melinda, she and I were the ones that got it the worst. It was our faces were just completely coated in this stuff. She, uh, she's a nurse by training and she, I could hear her talking to me and she's like, Lier, we've got to get our eyes clean. Like, this is serious. We can't stay here. I kind of like, I know you want to see this through. We've done enough. It's time now to call it. Like we've been seriously injured. It's time for medical care. Like it's enough. So it was just hard. Like I didn't, but it was useless to everybody. I mean, I, I just was sitting there on a ball, like unable to, to see anything. I was like, I can't, I can't help anybody. And I can't keep everybody together. I, there's, I'm useless. I've been hurt too badly. It's I'm done. I'm just, I'm, an, I'm a casualty at this point.
So I managed to like sort of stumble upright and she's like, this is sort of funny, but my thought of her was like, she's the mother duck and I'm the baby duck. <laughs> she's also really tall. So I could see her up ahead of me. I was like, I'm just following her down the street. I'm not really sure where we're going. There was a Whole Foods across the street and that's where she was headed because she knew there'd be a bathroom and we could probably call somebody to come help us. And there was also a thing right before that, I forgot about this part. It was actually really nice. One of the workers at Whole Foods came out. He saw what was happening and he came outside and he intervened. So he's, you know, a guy, you could hear his voice. I don't know what he looked like because I, I literally couldn't see, but um, I heard him talking and you can hear this on the audio. He's like, what are you doing? Stop, stop. And they're like, you don't know how bad these women are. They're horrible and they're terse and they're whatever. They're just saying like, they want to kill our friends. I remember one of them saying, that. <laughs> they want to kill our friends. I don't want to kill anybody. I was like, literally don't want to kill a single human being. Like, what are you talking about? All we want is for women to be safe. So he's like, they want to kill our friends. And this this guy from Whole Foods, like, no idea what they're talking about. He's like, look, I don't care. I'm not here for the debate. I am somebody who doesn't want to see violence. You are hurting women. Stop. Just stop it. Um, so this goes back and forth. But it was interesting to me because after that guy did that, they backed up a bit. Like they, it's like they he broke the narrative and he got them back into their frontal lobes. And it was like, they couldn't quite do it anymore. Like they broke you know, that amygdala, that just the red mist, they were out of it. They couldn't get back into it. So they had done what they could do. And it was like, eh, I'm not sure I can keep punching and kicking middle-aged women on the ground. <laughs> kind of, yeah, it's kind of psycho. <laughs> Try to remember that feeling. So anyway, that happened. Yeah. And we, we walked to the Whole Foods. They were taunting us the whole way. And they seem such ridiculous stuff. Like we're walking. The one I remember is this, it was a female voice, a woman. And she goes, you're not even a good writer, Lierre. It's just like, you think this works like What? 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 <laughs> it's like flat schoolyard stuff. Like, you might as yeah. well tell me my mother is fat and ugly. You know, like, she's so stupid. Anyway, yeah. it's just totally random stuff that I remember. Anyway, we got to the Whole Foods. There's a security guard inside there. He's so nice to us. But also, like, not surprised because it's Portland. Like, they're used to seeing crazy stuff in the streets of Portland. It's been going on for two years now. Anyway, they're like, oh, this is horrible. You poor people. Let's, I'm going to take you to the bathroom. Can you get there? Can you walk far enough? Like, yeah, yeah, just get us to the bathroom. Got us to the bathroom. I sent somebody out to buy either. I know better. You do not put water on pepper spray. It only makes it worse. But we had cold compresses. So at least we're like pressing the cold to our eyes, which is a tiny bit of relief. So she went out to get, it's a food store. Yay. So she went out to find the heavy cream or the half and half because that works. So for those of you who don't know, capsicum is fat soluble. It only responds to fat. You're only going to get it out of your eyes by using some kind of fatty substance. Water will only make it worse. It's not water soluble. So yeah. Never use water on that. Saline solution is also good. If you have any in your pocket, there's eye rinses that are made out of saline. You can use that too. But I, I mean, I knew it was like, don't bother with it. If it's just skim milk, it's not going to do any good. We need cream or half and half, please. So she ran out and got that for us. Came back. Oh, the relief. Oh my God. Uh -huh. <laughs> like a human being again. So then what, there's footage of this too. You can see us in that bathroom. It's me and Melinda. We're like hanging onto these things, gagging. And like, I'm still trying not to vomit. I've just never been through that level of pain before. Anyway, uh, we got our eyes cleaned up and then uh, one by one, all of the women came. They, they knew where we were. They found us. So we have a little confab there in the bathroom. What are we going to do now? I was like, I think it's over. I'm not sure. We could go back out and try our speeches again. I'm not, I don't know. Like, what is the thing we're supposed to do? Like, this is just, we're here in the moment. We, we've been set loose into the wild with our technique. This is where there's no black and white, right? I was like, okay, we have to decide. What do we do? And some of the women were like, I think we just need medical attention. I don't think this is a good idea to keep going. Also, all of our phones have been smashed and stolen. And we just, we don't have any way to know whether this has been recorded. Are we going to be able to get the word out at all? If nobody hears about it, it doesn't really work as a technique. The point is that the public has to see it to get people to understand you're making the violence visible. And have we done that? I don't know. So uh, we decided, all right, we're, we're going to call it a day for now. Let's see what happens. So we called the, um, we had sort of like quote getaway drivers. We had three male allies who had signed up to help us transport us, which was really nice. And they were great. So they came and they told us where to meet them. So we went out of the building. Some of the Trantifa dudes had come and they were harassing us through the store. They were still calling us names and all this. And the manager was a manager who came out and was like, stop it <laughs> don't do this not in my store i don't want to hear it you're not making trouble and he like really kind of backed them up and again they just stopped it's they couldn't follow through you know like they had many more opportunities to do us harm and it was this is the thing right like they know better they know that it's not okay to just punch and hit people 
and they have to be in this whole other state to get it done. And they couldn't make themselves do it. Like once it was broken. So they could have like, we got out onto the street and we were walking up to our van and like, there's so much more they could have done to us. Cause there was still like 40 of them and 10 of us, but they left us alone. So it was done. It was over. So we got into the vans and we went back to the house. Um, and then there was one more really hard decision we had to make. And, you know, again, like there's not a right or a wrong, but there were going to be women staying at the house overnight. And, the, and, and these men had our address. So how afraid are we? Do we want to continue to be doing resistance here now? Because they are going to come. So this could be another site where we stand in our dignified, stalwart, nonviolent posture and let them come and see what happens. Like, are they going to vandalize the house? Are they going to break the windows? Are they going to physically assault us? What does it look like to the world to show a gang of men breaking into a house where a bunch of peaceful women are trying to sleep? Like, go ahead and show yourselves. This is the nature of this movement. They are predators. They make it very clear every time. Are we prepared for that tonight? I think a lot of the women, it was their first time ever on a front line like this, and they had had enough because I'm telling you, it was life-threatening. I mean, we it was terrifying to be out there. And I completely understand the, the moment one woman said, I think I just need to feel safe again. Like, we're done. It's fine. It's over. We will make the place be safe. So the decision was made to hire security. So there was security there all night standing around just making sure. And indeed, the Antifa people did circle the block all night, but they they were too afraid by the big men. <laughs> they weren't going to do anything to the big men. They only want to beat up little women. So, so that was pretty much it. Um, we had a really wonderful debrief afterwards. It's, we sang songs, you know, took care of each other, had that kind of solidarity. Everybody called their families. It was really nice. We had, everyone had, you know, before we do this, everybody's given the list of contact names and numbers because we just don't know who's going to get hurt. You know, like we might need to call your mom. We might need to call your partner. We might need to call whoever. Put the person on the list. Everybody gets a copy of it. So whoever gets hurt, somebody else will know who to call. There were two or three women who actually were texting with Derek and like, uh-oh, shit's gone down. <laughs> Lier's lying in a pile on the ground. I think you might, You just. I'm just telling you what's going on. Um, yeah, so um, I actually left early because Derek drove to Portland and picked me up, which was really nice of him. The reason I'm telling you this is the level of saturation that we had with that pepper spray we all took showers we changed our clothes we still couldn't breathe in the house because there was so much pepper spray just ambiently on us i was in Derek's car for six hours on the ride home freshly changed clothes freshly washed hair for a week after anytime anybody got in that car they started coughing immediately there was that much pepper spray just in the air i was starting to get worried like how do we even get this out of the upholstery like it's clearly just in the plastic everywhere. I don't know that it's possible. Maybe like it's just trashed. What do I do? Do I like take it to some like super duper industrial cleaning? I don't, I don't know. Like I'm gonna have to find out. Anyway, it did fade eventually. It, the chemicals biodegraded, but uh, just the level of, yeah, that was what they sprayed us with. And I wanna point out, this was not my insight, but one of the women in my group did notice this. And I, I just need to tell the public this. These people brought a canister of industrial grade whatever cayenne pepper bear spray stuff to a public event at a library they were going to spray us in the library they didn't know we weren't going to make it into the library they came prepared to wreck a public library and the old people who lived upstairs and the people next door in the cafe that's what they were prepared to do so i just want you to really ask we keep being asked oh are you on the right side of history are you on the right side of history if these are your comrades, they're willing to do this to a public library. Old people upstairs in the building to middle-aged women? I don't know. I cannot believe that anybody listening to this thinks that, that this is actually a useful, effective, and moral thing to be doing to win in the court of public opinion. Were there any bystanders or audience members, or was it just the mob that attended the on-street event? Um, there were some bystanders. Uh, I didn't see a lot of this because I was assaulted pretty early on with the pepper spray or whatever it was. But I was told later by a woman who could see um, that there there were some other sort of interactions with people. So the main one, and this is pretty horrible, there was an old woman who was walking down the sidewalk, had nothing to do with us. She was just coming back from errands on a Saturday or Sunday morning, and they knocked her over. They hit her. Um, so they assaulted this old woman and our women went and stood around her and helped her out off the ground and tried to protect her. Uh, and then they were very lucky because there were 
people in a house that lived right there and they came running out to see what all the commotion was. And so we, uh, our women asked, can we come inside and take shelter? This woman's been hurt. And they were very kind and said, yes, of course, of course. So she uh, was taken inside of this house and, and allowed to stay there. And they checked her over for, you know, bruises or did, had she broken anything? Because I, I just want people to understand this, that breaking a hip is one of the most common causes of death for old people. So them knocking her to the ground is not some kind of, you know, just slapstick hijink silliness. It's quite serious. I mean, you shouldn't assault anybody. But the idea that these young men think it's okay to hurt an old woman like that is just really horrifying. And that this is what the left has become. I just want people to take a good long think here because this is just horrendous. Anyway, she was okay. She was shook up, but she was not, you know, she hadn't broken any bones. So they stayed with her for a little bit and then, you know, eventually were able to to help her out to safety. So that was one. <laughs> um, and then down at the library where we never got to the library, but there were women who arrived for this event, I, I assume to listen to what we had to say, and they were assaulted on the way out of the library. So there's photographs online of them getting hit in the head with various things and then one of the women had her they they tagged her jacket they spray painted on the back of her coat that anarchy that a in the circle symbol it's just really horrible um they have no idea what these women think or don't think i mean not that it's okay to assault people you don't agree with but they, they don't even know who these women were so and every time i've seen those photos posted online i always have tried to comment like i don't know who you are I hope you're okay. This looks really horrible. It's very traumatizing. You know, thank you for trying, like whatever. I just try to make supportive comments, but nobody has reached out to me back. So I don't know who they were. And I, I do hope that they're okay. It doesn't look like they were seriously injured, but I know how awful it is. You know, you can be fairly traumatized by having to face a mob, especially if you're alone and you don't have anyone to talk to about it later. You know, there's that whole sort of debrief that can happen after these events is just really important for everybody's emotional well-being. And I don't know that any those women got it. So I just hope they're okay, whoever they were. So those are the only kind of civilians that I know about who were present for this. Um, there may have been more that I just don't know about because we just we just don't know what happened to anybody else who might have turned up. So uh, yeah, so thanks for asking that question because it's always a concern. Um, I don't want to be using other people as human shields. You know, this was our event and we were prepared for it, but, and that's, I don't know other people on the street, whether they're prepared for this, because this is a very violent crew and they clearly have fully justified doing as much harm as they want to anyone essentially who walks by. And that is just wrong. I don't know how anybody thinks that these people are doing something that's righteous or good or, you know, for positive change, you just got to hurt random people on the street. I just the whole thing is just so collapsed to me. I don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand how the left has ended up here. So we were going to do it no matter what. I want everybody to understand that we are not going to be stopped by male violence. The entire point of this is that men do terrible violence to women around the globe and that transgender ideology is the new form. You know, they always are coming up with something new. And so this is the new one and we have no intention of ever backing down. So we are going to continue to be brave and we are going to continue to assert our rights. So um, I don't care that the police weren't there. That's not, wouldn't have stopped me. I'm just saying we were promised that there would be some level of protection for us to express our First Amendment rights. And that, that didn't happen. The state completely left us to this mob. So I can't imagine anybody listening to the account of what's happened over this year and not reaching a peak moment. I, <laughs> I can't imagine that. I can't imagine I that. So at the end so, of the day, we are covered in bruises. Um, I still can't breathe quite right. Uh, but we, my my women were so good. I am so proud of every last one of them. Nobody broke. We were under extreme stress. And it was an amazing thing to witness these brave, brave women standing for women, standing for the least of us, standing for the women in prison, standing for the women in the homeless shelters who have to share a shower with a man. You know, women have been raped now in homeless shelters because there are men in there. I want everybody to understand how bad this is. And it's the women that nobody cares about who are bearing the brunt of it. So we stood in that kind of solidarity and with that kind of bravery. And I'm just so proud of everybody who did it. Um, it, it was an amazing thing to witness. And you feel just, I, I can't say that you're happy because you got beat up, but you're so, 
you just feel so proud of everybody and you you know that we're going to get it done that we have that kind of strength that we can face them down and we're not going to give in and it it just is so it's like spiritually soothing that there is still good in the world and that that there are people who are willing to stand up and protect it so i'm just so proud of everybody so that's what happened and that's where we are and we're not giving up so there will be more next year a lot more next year so stay tuned for our further adventures yeah where do listeners look where do you plug in to support where do you plug in for trainings where do you go to to see all of this footage that you're talking about and thank you so much for sharing the things that aren't there some of these moments are so intense and they're just not there so we've we've been gifted a lot here what do we do Leah? best place to go is WDI USA's website. So it's Women's Declaration International dash USA. And um, I, we can put that in the show notes so people can find it easily. We'll put the link in there. You can look under there to find information about the the tour and to find information about upcoming nonviolence trainings. And if you want to host one of these trainings, we desperately need people who want to host us. So if you are on the ground somewhere and you think that your town or your city is prepared for this and you want to show you know the world that we're going to stand up for what's right or you even just want to learn about it but you don't necessarily know that you want to do it that's fine we are just there to teach people so be in contact you know send us an email and uh, we'll get back to you because we will go anywhere and we will tell you what we know about this and you can see if you like it see if you can add to it see if you know something about it that we don't know we've met some incredible women who have some incredible histories doing this like women a whole generation above me who have been through incredible things who have a lot to say about what we're doing. And it's always really helpful to talk. So all of that, um, you can also go to my group is Wolf. It's the Women's Liberation Front. And you can go to our website and see what we're up to and the lawsuits and the different things that we are doing. Um, And that's also another place to plug in. So these are the two really good groups that are trying to fight this mess right now in the United States. One or the other or both uh, will get you where you want to go. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for listening. I'm very excited. I'm very glad that you were able to spend so much time and get in so deep about this. And I know that the bruises are still fading from this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm a mess. <laughs> no. It's fine. I mean, it's like, it barely hurts, honestly. It really, yeah. it's, the eyes were the thing and that's over. So it, it's, it's all good. I knew what yeah. I was signing up for. It's fine. And I, you know what, at, at the bottom of my heart, I'm so glad it was me and not somebody else. It's like the mm-hmm. idea of other women getting hurt is so unbearable. It is that's the worst part for me. It's is knowing that other women are going to be vulnerable to this level of violence is really hard for me. So I'm just honestly relieved that it was me that they came for and not the and, others. Well, I'm just so inspired too by all of the decisions along the way and yeah. that women made those collectively yeah. and the decision wisely and knowing yeah. afterwards that they would have taken all of that pepper spray yeah. in there and it would have been elders and babies and they Horrible. you know you protected Horrible. You protected those dear folks, those dear souls too. Yeah, you tried. Good. Thank you, Lier. Please support radical feminist struggles. Educate yourself on nonviolent direct action and donate to Deep Green Resistance and support our work here on the Green Flame. On the Green Flame, you can listen to voices and be provided with information that is next to impossible to find anywhere else in the media landscape. Thank you very much for listening.